All right, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Creditor Podcast. I'm your host, Chase Palmieri, and with me today is Dave Pell. Dave is a self-diagnosed, lifelong news addict. He's also been blogging for over a decade, founded several news sites, invested in and advised more than 50 internet startups, and right now, uh, and has been curating one of the world's largest daily newsletters, which you can sign up for at nextdraft.com. Dave, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. So why don't you start by giving listeners a little bit more information about Nextdraft and especially how you put together that daily newsletter? Sure. Uh, thanks a lot. Well, basically, I, I used to write this newsletter called Dave and Edix back in the first boom, where maybe some listeners are too young to remember that. But uh, I basically did covered the sort of the top 10 news stories of tech news stories of the day. And I would send them out with CEOs of startups that I was advising back then, even though I was advising startups and working in technology, writing has always been my passion. So I figured I could mix the two things. And I started sending out these things to save people time because I didn't want them to waste time scouring the few uh, tech news sites that there were back then. And so I did the work for them and I'd sort of summarize the story so they would know what was going on and they can get back to their business. Uh, that sort of spread quite a bit and word got around. And after probably about a year, I had about 50,000 subscribers and it was really only for internet professionals. So in the early days of the first boom, that was really a pretty broad cross section of uh, the possible audience that I had there. Cause there were probably about 52,000 internet professionals. So it was pretty cool and it was fun, but then the bust came along and uh, it was sort of like writing a daily obituary column. So I used that sort of moment of uh, losing a lot of money and losing a lot of uh, joy to switch the brand around. And I switched it to Next Draft, which is probably a harder sell in terms of monetizing, but was more in my interest area. So I was much more passionate. And that was basically following the same model, uh, 10 stories a day, but covering all news, which is really what I've always been passionate about and interested in since I was a kid. So what, what I do basically now is every morning, or I, I basically do it all day. I'm checking for stories on Twitter and at night before I go to bed. But essentially the bulk of the work is at about 9 a.m. Pacific, I get up and I open about 75 tabs of news sites. I don't use any other tools. I just use the web because I want to take advantage of what the editors of those sites have chosen to sort of highlight. And I'm so used to knowing where to look on the page to collect the best stuff that it's sort of... Um, almost instinct at this point. So I open those tabs. I go through the internet basically and find what I find are to be the most 10 fascinating stories of the day. It's not necessarily exhaustive. It's not necessarily the biggest stories of the day. It's really personality driven. Um, I think of it sort of like a modern day column. So if somebody invented the form of the column today, uh, instead of following the patterns that we've always had. I think this is how it would look. It would be a bunch of takes with links off to the internet for more information. I wish more modern current columns did that. But that's sort of the model. And uh, it's very personality driven. It's uh, stuff I have a take about or have a joke about. And I link you off to the full story for uh, the rest of it if you're interested in that story. So you get like a an overview of here's what happened today. Here's enough to attend a dinner party and be pretty interesting. But if you want to know more about one, two or eight stories, you just click off from more. So that's the basic idea. Right. And we've seen a big resurgence as of late in uh, the power of the newsletter with services like MailChimp and Substack. But you've been doing this daily newsletter for how long now? Uh, I mean, in one format or another, I've been doing it almost since the internet started. So right. I've been doing it for a while. Uh, this next draft probably you know six eight years um i've done other iterations of it in the past though so yeah i've seen this sort of resurgence of newsletters probably about six or seven times this is the biggest one for sure uh and this is the first one that's not associated with um sort of overcoming the idea that email is dying um and all of a sudden now it's back which i find is the most interesting part of this particular story. And we can talk more about the resurgence of newsletters and, and those companies you mentioned uh, more because I think there's positives and negatives to it. But um, it is interesting that each other time that newsletters sort of became a big deal again, uh, that was followed by a period where everybody was sure that uh, email was so torturous and ruining their lives so much that it would not be the killer app and it would instead be killed. 
it turns out that now that we have Slack uh, and Telegram and uh, a million other social chat apps mixed with uh, the constant flow of Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, that actually email is pretty relaxing. And I think that's why compared to the old days when, or the more recent old days, I guess, uh, people aren't saying email was ever dead. I think email has always been here to stay, but I think people finally see the benefit of asynchronous uh, conversations. And the thing I like most about email really, which I don't think people appreciated enough until they were totally overwhelmed by other sources, is that it's really the only um, incoming flow or feed over which you are the algorithm. So Facebook, we know about the problems with their algorithm. Twitter is still putting in stuff that's either popular or promoted. Um, and it might be on a topic you're not interested in, but email is the one where you decide what goes in that inbox or not. Um, and the other good thing from a publishing standpoint is you're right in there with the reader's mom and the reader's brother and the reader's best friends. So they're giving you a trusted place. You have to earn your right to stay there. But it's different, I think, than appearing just on the web or in Twitter or other places where there's a million people in their feed. Yeah, and I saw a recent, or not a recent presentation, but I watched a presentation of yours where you spoke about how technology was able to solve the spam problem, which was able to help email newsletters begin to be more practical and thrive again. And again, touching on what you kind of just ended on, which is that your email is kind of this sacred trusted space where in that same presentation, you talked about how it's right next to your mom's email and you know your family. Can you speak to how solving that spam problem helped your email newsletter and, and what they did to solve that problem? Yeah, well, I mean, in the early days of email, uh, spam was, as big a problem as you can see uh, fake news on Facebook now. It was that huge of a problem. So basically there was a company called Brightmail. I was actually an investor in it, started by a guy named Sunil Paul, a great guy. And he basically came up with this model to allow um, companies and different email providers to sort of share a list of spam for the first time. It sounds very obvious now, but it wasn't back then. So that, uh, email that was tagged as spam on AOL would also be tagged as spam on Hotmail. And that really started to clamp it down. Years later, as people, almost everybody started to move to Gmail, Gmail got and bought a few companies and got really aggressive about it. So um, getting so much spam for the user was no longer as big a problem. So that made the inbox a cleaner place for somebody to deliver content. It actually created a challenge for newsletter writers because being falsely labeled as spam because so many people still used email to market unwanted and they still do send unsolicited messages. Um, after election season, we all know that because every time you gave a dollar, you got a million emails. But um, that made it harder for the sender to differentiate themselves and make sure they didn't get caught in spam filters. And unfortunately, when you're in that situation, there's not a ton of motivation for say a Gmail product manager to make sure your my newsletter is getting into your inbox. That doesn't rank that high on the uh, to-do list. Um, and it's also an incredibly complicated problem. Three or four years ago, I had a situation where my newsletter was going to spam or just disappearing altogether actually for a lot of Gmail users. Um, that's the frustrating thing about email. That one, that you can't edit it once you send and two, that sometimes mysteries happen and you don't know what to do to fix it. So at one point during this period, I had the CEO of MailChimp and the head of Gmail on the phone on a conference call describing the problem. And we talked about it for about an hour. And at the end, both people said, we're not sure what's going on. We're gonna to have to look into it. I can't fix this. So it's a really complicated issue. It's, it's for the user, it's a dream actually. For the sender, that's still the number one issue. If you're ever thinking about sending out a newsletter, what's the delivery ability and rate of the, of the provider that you use? The sad part about it is it makes it a lot harder just to do that stuff yourself. Delivering email accurately and effectively is really hard. So it's better to use a service, which is fine when you're first starting out, but sometimes it'd be better to be able to, like in the old days of blogging, you might wanna own your own blogger server on your own 
uh, box and be able to have full control over the experience. It's pretty hard to do that in email these days because if you set up your own server, it would take forever and you'd have to hire people to make sure you're staying in people's inbox. Yeah, and I think you were right to stick with email, continue building that long email list. We know from e-commerce companies and all sorts of different companies that that email list is valuable and that uh, being able to have a direct relationship via email with your user, customer, reader, whoever it is, is very valuable. Why do you think it is that this resurgence is happening now? What is it that's changed where these writers are finally ready to have a direct relationship with the reader? Yeah, I think, um... You know, the resurgence, it's a very narrow new thing that's happening, which is really journalists and writers are starting to move to Substack, which is a great service. And um, it's interesting that it's happening now. Um, I think what's happened, if I had to guess why now, I would say that in the last four years, because news has become everything for people and so overwhelming, both in some good ways, but mostly horrible ways. But whatever it was, the Trump show was nonstop. And whichever side you were on or whatever take you had, people were obsessed with that story. And then all of a sudden you got to 2020 and the pandemic took away movies. It took away sports. It took away going out and hanging out with your friends. And suddenly it wasn't just that the Trump show was the best show in town. It was the only show in town. So if you look at the last 18 months, especially, but the last four and a half years more broadly, there's been a ton of uh, media individuals who have become sort of super brands on the back of the Trump era. It's obviously good for them. It's a troubling sign for how we get out of this mess because so many people are part of this ecosystem now. Uh, Trump was horrible for democracy, but incredible for page views or listens to your podcast. So as people started to develop these really well-known brands, I think the temptation to say, I have readers that are coming to the New York Times, not just to read the New York Times, but to read my column there, made it easier to take the leap and say, okay, now there's this really easy service like Substack. I can ask my readers to uh, support what I'm doing through a subscri subscription. And for a pretty small amount of money and from a pretty manageable uh, list, I can make more than I'm making at this other job. So I think that was it. I, it's been building forever. Uh, when the internet first started and Twitter first launched, um, I was talking to a friend of mine, Mark Abanez, who works at Channel 2 Sports in the Bay Area. And I used to be an intern there when I was younger. And he was asking me, this is more years later, and he was asking me, you know, like, what do I do with this new thing, Twitter? And uh, how can I use the internet to my advantage? And I said, the first thing you want to do is make sure you get a username that's just your username and not associated with your brand, because that way it gives you a certain amount of leverage. And I've, I've seen over the years, sports casters or other personalities that were more or, old school, and they'd maybe get fired from a job calling the Giants games or whatever. And then they would have no recourse. They'd have one article in the newspaper about them getting canned, and that was it. Now you have these people with huge brands. They're individuals, but their brands have actually been leveraged off of the companies they work for. So Maggie Haberman is huge, but she's huge because of the times, but her Twitter is her own. So that is a really powerful thing. So I think that trend has been happening throughout probably the last decade and a half, but it was the Trump news era, I think that allowed people to break away because they had become in their own niche sort of household names. Yeah, and I think uh, we've seen a lot of big names move to Substack by leaving their news outlets in some, in some cases in big kind of public ways to say, no I'm, no, I'm no longer willing to be censored or checked by the editors or work with the people in my newsroom. I'm going to go to Substack and everybody who wants my articles can follow me there. That obviously has worked for a certain high brand select group of writers. Do you think that it's a model that can work for all writers or is it really just something where you have to already have built the brand either by working with an outlet or off of Twitter and then bring them there? I mean, of course the person who has the brand has a huge advantage can, and can start out making as much or more than they were making in, in, at their you know, branded gig. Uh, people can start from scratch or from a small list and get big fast if they have the right hook or if they really think uh, 
really carefully about what will sell and what will do well. Like if somebody's doing what I do, where they're linking to all news and covering a broad array of things, it makes it a, a lot harder. You know, I probably made my brand building about as hard as I could because it's a general topic that people think they already have too much of. So it's a bit of a sell to say, well, just try this, give it a couple of reads. It's really more like talk radio. You'll realize that you like it. Uh, whereas if you're doing a, um, you know, a newsletter that has maybe one recipe a day or more better, one stock to short that day, something financial, something about managing your household, something about dealing with your kids. It's a little bit easier because people know already that they have this need. Um, so I think it's doable, but it's definitely hard and you might have to spend some money and you have to be prepared that it won't work. Luckily with newsletters, people can do it while they're doing their regular job. And if it gets big enough, they can decide, hey, I wanna make this full time. The one thing you mentioned that I think is worth considering that's a little bit worrisome to me is you described accurately that there's a lot of um, journalists that have said, well, I don't wanna work for the man and I don't want to, uh, I wanna make more money and I don't wanna have, some of them, like you say, have come out and said, I don't wanna be edited. That's probably a slightly more narrow use case. The problem is, is that right now we're in a situation where everything is called news, whether it's news or not. And the biggest area I've always seen that is on cable news. That's where it started, right? CNN used to cover news. Now it's just people talking about the news. They might be talking about facts, whereas Fox is talking about make-believe, but still it's not actually reporters out there reporting 12 news stories an hour. It's like three people talking about one news story for an hour. So once you start to say, okay, that counts as news, it opens up the uh, possibility for Fox to more overtly say we're news also, because we're doing the same thing. We have three people talking about our opinion about the news right now. And I worry that this move to the indie journalism world, which is where I am part of, you know, I'm one of these people for sure. But I worry that that move will actually exacerbate that problem, that more people will call themselves news. Therefore, the meaning of what news is will become more diluted. And it's that right there is in the sort of circle of the biggest problem America faces today. So I'm a little worried about that part of the trend. Yeah, I agree. That was actually something I was going to ask you about was that it seems like the trend is that we're gonna have less investigative reporting and more commentary. And I think a big part of this is that commentary is cheap. You just throw somebody who's willing to spew their opinions in front of a camera or in front of a keyboard, and it doesn't come with all the costs of whether that's travel or attending an event or that on the ground reporting. Do you think that this is a trend that is kind of inevitable that over the next five to 10 years, it's gonna be more and more opinion and commentary as opposed to hardcore reporting? Um, I mean, it's the trend is already so huge that it's it's hard to imagine it getting much bigger. But now that the indies are getting involved, maybe it will. And it's not really my position to criticize because I am what you just described. I'm taking real news and linking to real news, but certainly putting my own overlay about what's important and my take on it. Um, so yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty worrisome, and I think it it probably will get more. And like you say, it's um, a lot cheaper to. Um, deliver an opinion than to deliver a fact uh, or to report a fact. Um, so that that's worrisome. The other factor that fits into this, I think, that people underestimate is that it's also much more effective to be telling an angle of the same story as everybody else. So we sort of first learned this in the, um, you know, I would say sort of the first Gulf War, but really the OJ trial was when CNN and realize, wow, if we just cover this same story 24 seven, it's to almost free for us. We have a camera in the courtroom. We have people talking about it and uh, people giving their tips or advice from lawyers, what, what's happening. And the beauty is, is that viewers know that anytime they have free time, it's like a soap opera. You just pop it on, you know all the characters, you're totally up to date with the story. So now imagine we're here in, 2020, uh, in 2021, and you're launching a newsletter and you want to give your opinion on something, the temptation to give your opinion on the same thing everybody else is talking about is pretty great because that's an easier sell and it, everybody knows what's going on. And it's like, it's like memes on Twitter. You know, when you put the Bernie meme out, everybody knows what you're talking about. So you can do two words and people get the joke. Um, the problem is, is that news is not all a joke. So what happens when we're all talking about the same thing millions of other stories don't get covered and 
that news story becomes something that's not just information, it's entertainment, it's our social life, it's our discussion topic. And we saw that over the last four years, how damaging it was and how great it felt on January 20th when it lifted at least a little bit. Yeah, I think that's right. One of the theses that we started Credder with was that news was going to become more and more a form of entertainment, not necessarily justifiably so, but that it would because reality, now that we have information about everything happening in the world, is more strange than fiction in many cases. Um, I want to ask you, you mentioned that you have some good things to say and some bad things to say about Substack. Can you give us some of the, the things you're not liking about that platform or what you're seeing around the platform? Yeah, it's not, it's not specific to Substack. Actually, the stuff I meant that I, when I mentioned that, this was the topic I was worried about. So many individuals breaking off from brands, not having editors over the top of them, and therefore the, the definition of news broadening. The idea of there being multiple ways for the indie creator to uh, get his creativity or art or words out there, uh, I'm 100% for, and I'm 100% for Substack. Um, that's, it's hard to believe with the mess that we've gotten ourselves into with the internet in the last 10 years, but that was what we were thinking when we were first dialing into the internet and thinking about the possibility was a broadening of the scope of voices you would hear and a broadening of avenues where people could express themselves and create and go straight to the consumer with whatever their product was, even if the product was themselves. So that part I find to be beautiful then and beautiful now. Yeah, and we also saw that kind of direct to the, the reader or direct to the viewer relationship play out with Trump and Twitter over the last four years, kind of the first time that a president has really circumvented traditional media and spoken directly to his supporters. Um, how do you think that the Twitter phenomenon plays into this? Because in some ways, Twitter is kind of like a newsletter, but for you know smaller tweets in that you follow, which is an equivalent to subscribe, and then you can reach your supporters directly. How different is this, is the MailChimp or Substack model from a Twitter and where are they different? I mean, they're, they're definitely close. The difference is, of course, is if you're in Twitter, you're part of a, a broad feed of maybe a thousand people that somebody follows and they may or may not see your, your tweets because it is moving all the time, unlike email where you open it up and it's right where you left it. Um, so it's different in that way. It's definitely not as much of a personal branding thing. Um, the sharing is 10 times easier and better, right? Getting somebody to forward an email is uh, much harder than getting them to retweet. Uh, in terms of this issue of Trump and uh, going direct to the consumer, I think it's tricky. The intention at the beginning was not to have these uh, mega platforms where uh, all of human discourse was gathered. The idea was to use the internet to take a bunch of places where human discourse was gathered and break it up into a million different ones. Uh, it ended up being the opposite. So now you have a situation where um, whether they're using it wisely or not, Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Dorsey, these guys have the power of kings basically. So we have a problem. I Trump needed to be removed from Twitter. Jack, I don't want having the power to remove him from Twitter. That's the conundrum. It's too much power in one company's hand. Um, it's great if it's Jack because uh, I think he might be a little more sensitive to these issues. It's not that great if it's Zuckerberg because he has an idea about life uh, that fits a certain model and discourse that fits a certain model that to me is just not accurate. But no matter what, I don't wanna have the future of my democracy depend on two or three billionaires. Just because you're good at making a social network or coding a photo sharing app, doesn't mean you know shit about editing news, philosophy, life or anything else. So all of that stuff I find pretty worrisome. I don't have a great um, answer to it. The biggest problem is that that stuff is all filling a vacuum that's been created by the absence of local news and trusted local leaders. Um, you know, if you have, uh, I live up the street from Marin City, which is a cool neighborhood here in Marin. And it's a place where um, you might have expected COVID to be uh, more of a challenge um, a lot of people were frontline workers. A lot of people were out of work. Uh, there was a lot of need for food. And 
Uh, I don't think there's much of a local paper in that area, but there's this one guy named Paul Austin who runs a nonprofit called Play Marin. And he understood the risk of COVID and he understood the needs that it would be created in large part because he talked to people who were experts and believed them. And from day one, he was putting out the word, you gotta wear a mask, you have to social distance. If you need food, here's where it's gonna be waiting for you every night in boxes. He got the local restaurant uh, restaurants to give away extra food, or in some cases he'd have people you know, pay for it and then the restaurant made some money to pay their workers. And Marin City ended up being a place that really didn't have much of a high uh, incident of uh, incidents of uh, COVID. So that local information that used to come from our newspaper can sometimes be filled like by people like Paul Austin, but too often it's filled by TikTok and Twitter. And uh, that's pretty dangerous, but it's definitely worth remembering that as much as we like to blame the platforms, the fake news, the lies, the conspiracy theories were not invented by Mark Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey. They were invented by people uh, in the Trump administration and on the right wing that were actively creating these conspiracy theories in order to divide people, in order to amass and retain power. They, it's not like these things came out of nowhere. Yes, they, it feels good to get angry at the other side, no matter which side you're on, and people understand that, but the ability, the biggest thing that Twitter gave Trump and that Facebook gave Trump was actually not the direct to consumer broadcast platform. The biggest thing they gave Trump or anybody in his position, any political leader who's trying to win with a minority of support uh, was the ability to measure what messages work. Um, so, a liar always has an advantage over a truth teller because the liar can figure out first, what is that, what do these people want to hear? And then sort of massage their message to be that. Um, Twitter and Facebook make that incredibly easy to do. So why did Trump pick birtherism as his big issue that made his campaign take off? He didn't. He tried 7,000 messages for 20 years of running for president and one caught on like crazy. It happened to be a racist one, but that either played into his uh, personality traits or it was something that didn't matter. The point was it took off. So birtherism became the core of his messaging. Um, so I think there's more lessons we can learn from Trump because of his media savant nature than from his expertise at broadcasting. It's that he was able to feel and measure what would work. And that held up a mirror to American society that was uh, pretty distorted and pretty disturbing. Yeah, related to that, I've heard you before um, tell a very good anecdote about Nazi Germany, um, about how they first had to put the Jews in the ghettos to remove that interpersonal connection that many Germans had with their fellow Jewish neighbors before the propaganda campaign could begin. Can you touch on that and how that relates to echo chambers today? Yeah, that's my theory. I should I should add the caveat that since I've been telling that story, uh, my mom told me it's bullshit and I'm wrong, and that her neighbors and everybody hated her the second that the anti-Semitism kicked up. So I'm not 100% sure about the Holocaust analogy, but I am sure that once the Jews were ghetto-wise, it was much easier to create uh, a more, more false and unbelievably distorted version of what a Jew was, whether what they look like or whatever. Um, and the echo chambers, they don't do that on their own, but political leaders who seek to divide us um, create this situation where uh, I, as a liberal elite uh, from a good school and a coastal city, uh, have these certain values or personality traits in the minds of my rural red state American counterparts. And likewise, I have a perspective from them, now, uh, of them. Um, when we actually meet people and hang out with them, whether they are uh, professors or uh, construction workers or people who work at a grocery store or any walk of life, teachers, doctors, whatever, almost immediately you find areas to connect with people. 
those aren't the main things about us, where we went to school, where we live. The main things about us are we're humans and we have a pretty narrow set of values and desires. We want to make sure we're safe. We want to make sure we have food. We want to make sure our kids are okay. And we want to get along with people and, you know, have as much pleasure as you can during your downtime. So I've never met anybody in real life that I hate even close as much as I hate the caricature of a Trump voter that I've seen for the last four years. So again, and now I'm not talking about people who are storming the Capitol um, necessarily. And I'm not talking about people who are wearing camp, camp Auschwitz sweatshirts, you know, but I'm talking about the average person that might have some political differences from us. It's in the advantage of the uh, political class to keep us divided, it's divide and conquer. You know, the, the point is, I don't wanna give, uh, I don't wanna move a lot of the American economy into the hands of working Americans. So what do I do? I have to give them something that means as much or is as emotional to them as getting that share. So I distract them with, there's this other that's terrible and hates you. And then I do the same with the other side, right? There's uh, plenty of uh, people from the coast who vote against their economic interests, just as many, because they're so worried about um, this other culture taking over America. So it's this huge advantage to the people who actually want to make laws that are beneficial to the few and not the many, which is the American way. So I think it's pretty dangerous or very dangerous. And the sad part about it is there's not really a great way to undo it. And I don't want to take the pressure off or the blame off my side of this equation. Uh, there's too many TV shows that make uh, country bumpkins look like idiots. Uh, there's too many news stories that cover just the most extreme, extreme person in a rural town or a farming community. And it's just not real. So, I mean, I saw, um, during the Democratic National Convention, they had a roll call because it was a pandemic where they showed people, uh, two to five people or whatever from each little community that uh, you know, announced the electoral votes for Biden and Harris. Um, and just seeing those little glimpses of you know, miniature reality TV from these different places, it was like such a breath of fresh air. It's like, this is what makes life worth living is these differences between us. It's what makes life interesting. You know, my dad was the only survivor in his family. And in 1993, we went back to his town. And it was, when he was a kid, it was like a bustling town with great food and a ton of culture. And we, when we went back there, it was just like a shithole with the same, people were pumping from the water from the same well that he was pumping from. And it was just like a dead town. And it's like these differences in diversity is what makes us uh, interesting and good. And I just, I wish people would just leave both extremes, the extreme wokeness and the extreme hatred and just meet in the middle on this sort of common humanity. And the internet makes that more difficult, even though we thought it would make it better, but it's really politicians who have an advantage of doing that. Yeah, I'll just add on to that to kind of sum up a couple of your key points there. So one being that we're fed the culture war to distract us from the class war, the, the real issue. And the other being that when we don't work across the aisle and actually establish interpersonal relationships with the people we disagree with or we think we disagree with, it creates the space for the stereotypes to become uh, what we think of as that person. Um, to switch gears a, a second here, Back to the newsletters, because in a, in a way you've been right on this for a long time and, and now the, the world, the media world seems to be kind of coming back to where you've been, is how big is passive content at, at, at playing in this role? Because you can see that you got this email from Next Draft and you don't have to open it. You can check it out later, as opposed to when you maybe check the Fox News cable channel and you either catch the cable news at the right moment to hear the right story. How big is passive content uh, uh, playing a role in this? Um, yeah, I usually call it asynchronous content because it's uh, you can read or respond to it when you want. Um, I think it's a big deal. I mean, I think it's the, the area where I really think it comes into play is especially during when I first, I was didn't write next draft for a few years and then several years ago, what six, eight years ago, I, I was thinking about doing it. 
And a friend of mine I used to work with on another project kept saying, you should bring it back. And I said, I, I'm just worried that people are so overwhelmed by the deluge of tweets and Facebook feeds and news and nonstop everything that what do they want one more news source, you know? And he said, no, that's the reason they want it because they're so overwhelmed by that feed. They need somebody to stop it in place and say, here's just today. And so I, I do think that's part of it. Um, just to be able to sit back when you want in your own time. It's like the opposite of news notifications really, which are so ridiculous and detrimental to us as users. They only benefit Apple and or the publications, right? Like why the hell do I need to know this second about a mudslide in Peru? What am I gonna do? I'm not a first responder. You know, I need to know if my mom has fallen and she hasn't, can't get up. I don't need to know anything that's happening in DC right now. You know, we, we made it for 200 and something years, only finding out that information the next morning when it landed on our front stoop. And we managed to stay much further away from authoritarianism with that level of information than we are now when we're supposedly informed 24 seven. So yeah, I think email doesn't do that thing to you. Um, and it's partly the, the technology and I think it's partly just a vibe. I know if I do that to you, you're gonna unsubscribe. I, I don't deserve to be in that inbox with people that you know and trust. Um, I think it also, the other piece of it that's a lot different from the web is that, and especially if you work for a brand, is that you can share your own personal um, asides uh, in there. So, um, hey, I'm not gonna be writing tomorrow because it's my son something at school or whatever. That kind of stuff is actually what people really connect with and builds, I, I hate to say build your brand because it sounds more gross than it is, but it's actually just building your rapport with people. I get way more emails, um, not way more during this last political few years, but, way, but a lot more emails I think over time from people about personal things uh, that I put in my newsletter than I do about um, news stuff. And that's always been a pretty telling sign for me. That's why when a blogger, it's, there's not as many blogs anymore, but when a newsletter writer or a, one of the old school bloggers links to your site, you get a lot more traffic than you do from a big media brand because you know that that person, you know the person, right? I know Jason Kotke and he's telling me, I know you trust me and I'm telling you to check out Dave's newsletter. So that's a much bigger deal than uh, the New York Times saying, here's the top 20 newsletters out there right now. It's just, even though they're both written by one person, it's just different. And email makes it even more personal. Yeah, another thing I've heard you speak to is this war on media or the, the idea that the media is the opposition party. Um, I think we can agree that there's a lot of dangerous rhetoric around that and a lot of dangerous side effects for reporters on the ground covering events and things like that. But I'm wondering how much you think that this building sentiment has to do with the fact that news consumers haven't really had a way to hold media accountable for a long time. And we, we're continually more and more frustrated with the news we're seeing, yet there's still no real accountability. And so it boils over into these, this kind of rhetoric. Um, it's, it's hard to say. I feel like we have a little bit more ability to hold them accountable now than pre-internet, just because uh, letters to the editor weren't too effective. Um, and having 10,000 people say this article is wrong is actually pretty pretty good um, and pretty damaging to the brand. And we've seen sources have to retract stuff. Um, there are definitely flaws in the media, especially if we take the term writ large and say we're including cable news and we're including uh, newsletters and everything in between. Um, but the contempt for news organizations um, is certainly a strategy that was deployed over the last few years. Um, it's taken right out of McCarthyism and uh, Roy Cohn's strategy. McCarthy was sort of taken down by Edward R. Murrow's, uh, you know, monologue about how terrible he was. Not that there weren't other journalists that led them to that point, but that was a lesson a lot of people uh, on the right and a lot of people who wanted to control the, the message took from that moment. So you saw Trump from the second he had a chance to win the election, smashing on the media 
it became a much different story later in his tenure when I think he started to believe what he was making up. But in the early days, it was just all about crushing the media. And he admitted that to Leslie Stahl. So I don't want to conflate the two problems, just like I don't want to conflate the problem of social media faces with the problem of people um, sort of aggressively lying. Um, but there's no doubt that I find that media gets the story wrong a lot less than they just get the story lazy. I mean, I, my, always, my feeling is always, if you are part of the story and you read the story, you realize how wrong it is, right? So in the early days of tech, when that was my whole life, I'd always see articles by tech writers that were just wrong or lazy or didn't mention any of the products that were in the space or efforts that it were similar that had been made before. And I think that's the same in um, everything. Um, it's also just tricky being part of the whole internet ecosystem. You know, like if you look at Buzzfeed over the last two or three years, they've had some of the best investigative reports I found on the internet, but they put it in a framework that just looks ridiculous and always has these stupid headlines about Kourtney Kardashian. And I understand those sell and those pay the bills for the other work, but that format makes it impossible for the average consumer to take that story seriously. Um, that's a microcosm of the whole internet in a way. Um, you know, a, uh, a New York Times stories ultimately appearing in the same ecosystem as that Courtney Kardashian story. So um, that worries me. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. A lot of the stories that we feel like journalists get wrong has to do, I think, with laziness because of a few things. And I want to ask you if which of these you think is the bigger factor. Um, is it a, that they're just not industry experts in what they're covering, but they're being asked to put out so many articles a day that they're bound to have to report on topics or industries that they don't really know that much about? Or is it B, does it have to do with the online incentives pointing users towards advertising to satisfy advertising partners and therefore there's an incentive to just rush out that story and it doesn't really matter how long the story is as long as there's a headline that people will click to. Yeah speed is huge for sure um, and creates a lot of errors and like you say short articles getting it up for the page views. I think it's probably more um, being able to focus on one story for a long time and becoming an expert on that story. It's so amazing when you either read an article or see a journalist on uh, cable news or whatever, discussing their story for like 15, 20 minutes. And you realize that from reading the headlines and the leads, you just didn't really understand the intricacies of this. I saw somebody talking about that GM is gonna go all electric by 2035. And as I heard that, I wish I could remember her name, but as I heard the reporter describing the story to Rachel Maddow, I just learned a ton of information about that industry and it was great, you know? The problem is today I've always felt, and I could be wrong, I mean, I'm not a journalist, but I feel like there's too many people on the same story. Um, I just feel like there's just too many national stories and not enough niche and no local stories. So, if I wake up in the morning after a presidential debate, I see my local newspaper, the front page is all about that debate with uh, write-ups from local journalists. Why do they need to do that in the age of the internet? You know, on they're, they're all subscribing to the AP's feed and they know that we can click and look at CNN and the Washington Post, the Atlantic, the, you know, there's plenty of national publications that cover this stuff. I just wish more local publications would stop trying to compete with what's already out there and would focus more on local. I think that's one of the big mistakes they made. And because of that, you have 50,000 writers writing about a debate when there's really like 10 to 15 writers who know that shit so well and they already have written the articles and it's a fucking click away. Like, just give me the link. I don't understand why people don't just, if I ran my local paper, the Marin Independent Journal, I would never write about any kind of national stories on the web. It doesn't make sense. Just link to them. And in the paper version, just give me the AP stuff or 
uh, get the wire from the New York Times or whatever, and have your people focus on what they can really become experts on, not what they're watching on TV or rewriting a wire story. Why? To whose benefit? It, there was a benefit to it 50 years ago because it was my only newspaper, but now it's not. So what's the point, you know? Isn't that, so I kind of think about that as the globalization of news, which again, I think has to do with satisfying advertisers, because if you can ha write a story that relates to literally every single human being on the planet, because it's some big international or national story, you have a bigger audience that could potentially come through and, and get in front of those advertisers. Yeah, no, I'm sure a lot of this stuff has to do with uh, advertising, internet advertising, breaking media. I mean, the worst thing that ever happened to uh, the media industry is measurement, you know, because before you'd go out and, you know, I knew a guy who used to uh, do VH1 ads, you know, and he said like his whole year was one boat party uh, out on the Hudson, you know, and that schmoozing in his relationships and he sold the wad and that was it, you know. But then suddenly in the early days of the internet, it really was that way. I mean, uh, local newspapers and other, other sources, smaller sources, you could get a lot of money because people were used to paying for um, branding. And once you could measure that and say, no, I'm only gonna pay for the guy who clicks and buys the product and I only wanna target that guy, that really was a crusher for media and they have not figured out a way to, uh, a way to adapt to that. I think during the peak of the pandemic or the, not the peak, but the, we are in the peak, but the first few months, like uh, there was a the toilet paper shortage and an Australian newspaper printed an edition with eight blank pages. So you could use that. And I thought, man, it took 20 years, but finally a local newspaper figured out a uh, business model for the internet age. Yeah. Um, one thing that you just reminded me of is when we were talking about Substack earlier, how these big writers can bring their brand and their readership over to Substack and they can overnight make more money than they were at the outlet, but that, that, that model doesn't necessarily work for every writer or even other writers that they worked with at that outlet that don't have the big name brand. I think we're seeing something, something similar with the New York Times and the Washington Post who are reporting these record numbers of subscription revenue. But I wonder if you think that it's the same thing but happening at the outlet level where the big brand outlets are getting enough subscription revenue to survive, but that consumers are only willing to subscribe to one or two big name outlets and that everybody else, it's almost like a wasteland of subscription revenue. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. It's totally brutal. Um, and the weird thing is, or I don't know if it's weird, but the troubling thing from my perspective, doing what I do is that almost every publication now has a paywall up, even if there's really very little chance that paywall is gonna be successful. I mean, I sometimes hear some launch and I just don't get it. Unless you're a big national brand and um, an era of high news interest like we're in, and you're the Washington Post, the New York Times, great. Or if you're a financial uh, information, so I figure, hey, I'm, going to either make or not make a few hundred grand off of this. What do I care about? 10 bucks a month, right? But if you're just regular news uh, competing with that, it's, it's really difficult. And what happens is that um, you get these good writers and people can't read their stuff because they have so few subscribe paying subscribers. And then for me, it's a nightmare because I get hate mail 10 times a day saying, why do you only link to sites with paywalls? And I can tell the people how to get around the paywalls, you know, but I only do that a one-off because like you, I want these media brands to thrive. So I don't want to be the guy to write an article or a newsletter that says, hey, it's really pretty easy to get around 90% of these paywalls. Here's how you do it. But yeah, it's, it's a bummer. And, you know, as costly as regular news is, uh, fake news is dead free. Yeah. Um one last question for you here on news before I get to the questions, the last two questions I ask every guest that comes on the podcast. So last question here is, relates to the future of newsletters. Um, you've been very forward looking with newsletters. You've been right more than maybe anybody else in the industry. You've been right, you, you planted your flag and waited for the, the wave to come to you. I'm wondering if you think that newsletters are kind of like what we're seeing with podcasts. And I mean to, to offend myself a little bit here that everybody has a podcast nowadays. Do you think everybody's gonna have a newsletter? What's the future of newsletters? I mean, there's definitely will come a point where there's too many of them, you know? Um, 
which is why uh, a lot of the discovery stuff like Substack is doing now, having sort of almost an RSS reader for uh, your, your uh, newsletters is a good idea because that gives them an advantage over other newsletter services because, hey, if I'm just starting out, maybe I can get mine in the feed or get some promotion in the network. Uh, so the network effect is good. It's a little different than podcasts because there's just so many hours in the day. So like I get people recommending podcasts all the time. And honestly, I'm a Howard Stern addict. Um, it just, that's my, my getaway from regular news. I just need uh, that. And for people who haven't listened to him for like 10, 15 years, it's not shock jock stuff anymore. It's really interesting and, or funny and interesting interviews, whatever. Uh, it's my uh, guilty pleasure. So, but that's like, he does 12 hours a week, you know? So I drive, you know, not even that much during this damn pandemic, but in general, that takes up a lot of my, my airtime. So that's the thing I worry about more, not Howard Stern, but I worry about more from podcasting that they just take a while. Um, they're really good, you know, but I feel like they're almost more competing with your TV time. Um, and then they're competing with music also. And TV and music are just so goddamn good, you know? I'd rather compete with uh, your letter from your mother, honestly. That's great. All right, um, before we get to the last two questions, why don't you give listeners a few URLs wherever they should go to follow your work? Sure. Um, you said I was early on newsletters and really right. I, it's also just inertia. I just planted my flag and then I just got fat and lazy and stayed there. But um, one thing that I think is important for anybody creating content is you should create content for wherever the people are. So Next Draft is available at nextdraft.com. You can sign up for it. It's a free newsletter. There's also an iPhone and iPad app. Uh, so you can just search for Next Draft on the App Store. Uh, if you're an Apple News user, you can just search for Next Draft and it uh, comes in there as well. Uh, if you'd rather get it RSS, it's on the footer of the site. Uh, there's a blog version. Um, so that I think is uh, probably the most important thing any indie creator can do is not try to pull people where they want them to be, but just say uh, it's next draft wherever you want to get it. Cool. All right. Last two questions for you here. They're very off topic, but it uh, is always good to break people away from their normal talking points. Bitcoin, are you a believer or not so much? Uh, I'm a not getter. I got to be honest. I should get it. It makes me feel too old to invest. I still invest in startups, but I just, for the last several years, I've just been praying uh, in a secular way that Bitcoin would just not be a thing. So I wouldn't have to learn about it because I don't get it. My son is telling about his friend who's mining it and gets a percentage for mining it. And I just, I don't know what he's talking about. Um, but you know, money is an idea and markets are an idea. So to that extent, I'm certainly a believer in it. It's certainly as real as GameStop stock. Um, you know, when I was a little kid, I, my dad was explaining the stock market and then he said, and then if it goes up, you sell. And I say, okay, so then you win. And he goes, no, you earn. And man, it's like 40 years after that conversation. And it still seems like you win to me. I don't, you know, it's just all supply and demand. Anytime I try to explain it to my own son, it's like, but wait, what makes it go up? Are you actually buying a piece of the company? It's like, nah, it's like you're sort of going to Vegas, man. So to that extent, uh, you know, the stock market has been digitized. Why shouldn't currency? Before I get to the last question, did you have any thoughts you wanted to share on the GameStop situation? Uh, I thought, you know, <laughs> the thing I thought was interesting about the GameStop situation is it's partly as huge a story as it is because it has a few elements like funny interest and money and the little guy supposedly against the big guy. It's partly a huge story because it came right after Trump was out and it's just so magical and wonderful to be obsessed about a topic and have your kids texting you about a topic and everybody talking about a topic, your mother and your children that's not Trump, that it's just unbelievable. I think that makes it bigger than it is. But the funniest part about it is, is that when this kind of stuff happens, every single person with a social media account or a computer feels like they must have a take. And most people don't know a fucking thing about the stock market. I always say, never trust financial journalists when you're talking about startups and never trust a technologist when you're talking about the stock market. 
Even people who focus on the stock market their entire lives don't know what the fuck is going to happen tomorrow. So how in one minute can somebody who has never invested and never thought about the issue be an expert and have an expert opinion on what's going on between Reddit and GameStop? I read that that represented every single facet of life that it could possibly represent. So to me, that's in my weird way of thinking, it, this GameStop story is just more about the story of our human need to have a take, whether or not we have a take or not. Yeah, and a lot of that is that people are being rewarded by having hot takes and being willing to kind of come out and speculate as to what was going on behind the scenes, even though we might not ever truly know what was happening behind the scenes. Um, yeah. Okay, last question for you here is, are we living in a simulation? No, we're not living one, we're watching one. What's the simulation we're watching? Just the cable news nightmare? All of it, the news, yeah. It's, it's, it's a simulation that distracts you from your real life to your detriment. And I think if people, I always tell people, I mean, I'm the most news obsessed person in, in the world, so I'm not pointing fingers. But imagine over the last four years, if you hadn't read any news, you had gone and sat under a tree in the forest somewhere with a few books and just lived your life. Would you be net better or net worse mentally and in terms of being informed than you were that having done what you did? You know, I don't think there's much doubt about it. Nothing about the last four years of media consumption did anything positive for anybody alive. So at some point you gotta say, if a product makes me feel like shit, why do I keep using that product? Well, there's only a few products like that. And most of them we have rehab clinics for. So that's, that's why I think we're watching a simulation, not living in one. Do you think that we're gonna soon have rehabs for Facebook, a Twitter specific rehab? You think things like that will pop up? Um, we might need them, but if they're not here by now, I doubt it. Uh, I have a friend who's a shrink and at the peak of the election rigging, rigging bullshit last month, he finally gave in and got on Twitter. And I mean, he was a monster within 45 minutes and I had to talk him off of it. Like a week or two later, he kept sending me tweets and I said, dude, you're angrier, you're unhappy. And why would you want to get sucked into this when one of our friend group is already like a waste case, which is me. Why would we want to give another person to this machine? So it's a dangerous thing. There's no doubt about it. Um, it's so goddamn addictive, you know? I'm the worst, you know? If I hear something on the news and I have a joke about it, man, I'll pull over on the freeway to get my tweet out, you know? And that probably makes me among the healthy people. Most people just do it while they're driving. <laughs> so I don't know if we'll have it, but we definitely need it. Cool. Well, Dave, thank you for joining us today. Been a great episode. And I hope everybody goes and follows your work at Next Draft. Thanks again. Thanks a lot. It was great.